Manchester University or PTII or what is lost in Hyderabad University. But two weeks back, similar effort has also been made in, uh, in this campus. So the point is that we need to constructively engage in this debates and discussion. And uh, I invite Professor Prabhat Patnaik. Professor Prabhat Patnaik needs very leading introduction. He is a leading Marxist economist who has worked on political theories and contributed to the PhD. And uh, without wasting time, I request Prabhat to start. Friends, I am very grateful that you have come on a Saturday evening uh, for this lecture. I am also very grateful that I have been given this opportunity to talk to you. I am not actually a historian and I really am not a person who is any kind, can claim any kind of expertise on the question of nationalism. But what I want to do is to just share with you one or two things which have struck me in the course of thinking about these issues following from the kind of developments which have been taking place in JNU. As you know, in JNU there was all this talk about the students being anti-national, and that set me thinking, what is national and what is anti-national? And in the process of doing so, I felt that the concept of nationalism which is now being propounded on the basis of which the students are being called anti-national is a concept which is quite different from the concept of nationalism that underlay our freedom struggle, that underlay our anti-colonial struggle. In other words, what strike struck me with great force is the fact that nationalism is not a homogeneous concept. It's not one thing which is, you know, uh, either you believe in it or not believe in it, or, you know, I mean, you are a national, you, you subscribe to it or you are international. It's not one thing that nationalism is not a homogeneous concept. And particularly, the trajectory of the development of nationalism in Europe was quite different from the trajectory of development of nationalism in India. It's, it's a point which is often not recognized by many people, including by people on the European left. So I'd like to devote a bit of time to discussing this. This is the concept of nationalism, nation, nation states became common in Europe after the Westphalian treaties in the 17th century, which ended the Hundred Years and the Thirty Years Wars. When that happened, you had the emergence of this nation states and, and, and generally talk about nationalism, even though you get whiffs of nationalism even in the writings of Shakespeare, which actually predate the Westphalian treaty. Now, the concept of nationalism, nation state, as it developed in Europe, had a number of very specific characteristics. The first characteristic was that it was always associated with an enemy within. It was not an intrusive notion of nationalism. The enemy within changed. In Southern Europe, which was mainly Catholic, the enemy within would be the Protestants. In Northern Europe, which was Protestant, the enemy within would be the Catholics. All over Europe, the enemy within would include the Jews. So that you actually found that there was always, it was not an intrusive notion of a nation, but you actually had this idea of an enemy within. Okay. The second aspect, the second feature of European nationalism, or nationalism as it developed in Europe, is that the nation was seen to stand above the people. In other words, there was something called the nation, which was by no means identical with the people, the interests of the people, the living conditions of the people. The nation stood above the people. And the ac accumulation of national wealth became an objective per se, irrespective of what it meant for the people. 
because of which, since accumulation of national wealth, irrespective of the material well-being of the people, becomes an overwhelming objective of the nation, it was actually associated with the emergence of capitalism. As a matter of fact, nationalism, as we know in Europe, has been associated with capitalism and with different forms of capital in the different periods of capitalism. Mercantile capitalism was the initial material foundation for nationalism in Europe. The idea, Elizabethan nationalism, where you actually go and uh, you know grab hold of places at the expense of the Spaniards. So the conflict between England and Spain was associated with who could get hold of a larger booty from all over the world. As a result, this nationalism is one which was associated to start with, with mercantilism. As you know, mercantilism believed that the wealth of a nation consisted in the gold and silver that had its command. And therefore, if you can get hold of gold and silver, which the Spaniards were taking away from Latin America onto Spain, for Britain, then that was what British nationalism was all about. The second feature, and, and, and likewise, when the concept of national wealth changed with Adam Smith, Adam Smith's book was called An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. The whole purpose of the book was to show that the wealth of a nation consisted not in the gold and silver, but in the amount of capital stock it possessed. Consequently, a country which was actually richer, a nation that was richer, is one that possessed a larger capital stock. But nowhere in Smith or classical political economy is there any proposition that says that if a nation possesses a larger capital stock, its people will become better off. On the, on the contrary, the Ricardian theory believed that actually the wages of the people, working people, would already be tied to the subsistence level. So the nation becomes richer, acquires larger capital, but the people in fact do not become any better. But at the same time, the increase of this capital stock is supposed to be the objective of the nation. Later on, we actually come across the, notion, the, the nationalism being linked no longer just to mercantile capital, that is an era past, no longer just to industrial capital, that's an era past, but finance capital, particularly uh, Rudolf Felferding, very well known Marxist author who actually analyzed finance capital, wrote a famous book called Finance Capital, which Lenin relied on in developing his theory of imperialism. He said that the ideology of finance capital was a glorification of the idea of the nation. And of course, we know that during the First World War and so on, there was this idea of the glorification of the nation which actually was the ideology on the basis of which rival finance capitals were actually fighting. If you have seen uh, or read the book All Quiet on the Western Front by Eric Maria Remarque, that's basically what the book is saying. How you have in the war years this whipping up of nationalism, which of course is basically uh, whipping up done by finance capital and the media at the command of finance capital. The second feature of, of the, the, the third feature of, of nationalism as it developed in Europe, which in a sense is linked to the previous two features I was talking about, is that it was necessarily imperialist. Within <coughs> weeks of the Westphalian treaties, Cromwell's armies went and occupied Ireland, which was the first colony in the world, and of course, the British landlords took over the bulk of the Irish lands. And of course, throughout the subsequent period, you found that while Britain and France, as nation states, they coexist in Europe without entering into wars, which came later, of course, but at the same time, they were fighting bitter wars all over the world in the quest of colonies. British, so, so this capitalist imperialism, capitalist national, world war nationalism that developed in Europe was from the very inception imperialist. The acquisition of national wealth in the form of gold and silver meant basically to take the, the, the loot of gold from, from the Latin American colonies and subsequently even when you moved the era 
where wealth is no longer seen as gold and silver, as a measure card or industrial capitalism, then you have the imposition of free trade on the colonies which provide markets and then you have taken the way of raw materials from them and consequently you have again imperialism. The nature of imperialism changes but on the other hand from the very inception nationalism, bourgeois nationalism as it developed in Europe was imperialist. So you had this peculiar kind of nationalism which I call aggrandizing nationalism. Its feature was aggrandizing aggrandizement at the expense of minorities inside, aggrandizement in the sense of not being intrusive and being based on exploitation of the working people whose conditions don't change even though the nation has been glorified and aggrandizement at the expense of people far away uh, in colonies and so on acquisition of an empire. Now, of course the countries that became nation states later like Germany and Italy and so on found that they have been left out of this process of advertisement. They appear rather late on the scene, and the world is already divided up between the British and the Dutch and the French and so on. And as a result, their nationalism took a particularly aggressive form, and of course, uh, it led to the wars, which as Lenin said, was meant to be partition, an already partitioned world, and to the extent that the war, First World War, was not a successful venture for Germany, for repartitioning and various severe conditions were imposed on Germany, this nationalism took an even more kind of intense form and gave rise to fascism. Fascism was the most aggressive, it was the apogee of aggressive nationalism and that in turn led to the Second World War. But because of this aggrandizing character of nationalism that developed in Europe, because of the fact that this aggrandizing nationalism gave rise to two world wars and fascism, progressive opinion in Europe has increasingly tended to see nationalism as a bad thing. That they have tended increasingly to move away from any concept of a nationalism. As a matter of fact, the formation of the European Union, which is a supranational entity, has the complete backing of the European left and you know, all progressive democratic opinion which wants to transcend this nationalism phase and therefore wants a supranational entity. Now this creates problems for the European left as you may have seen in the context of the Greek developments namely that the right, you know, European Union can represent the transcendence of pre-existing nationalism but at the same time, European Union is dominated by German finance capital. So how do you then support and sustain an institution that is dominated by German finance capital? The Greek finance minister Varoufakis thought that he can persuade the Europeans that listen, if you have domination of European finance capital, if you don't give good, to good conditions to Greece, then Greece will take it and any breakup of the European Union would help fascism in Europe, that others would understand this and therefore give Greece good conditions that others did not bother about it and consequently Greece had to compromise. But be that as it may, I believe that's one of the biggest dilemmas of the European left, but we don't get into that here. But the fundamental point is that the concept of nationalism which has emerged in Europe is something which was an aggrandizing kind and European progressive opinion has tended to move away from this concept. Now the concept of nationalism that developed in colonial countries, countries like India for instance, was an altogether different thing. This is not the same as the aggrandizing nationalism. This difference consisted not only in the fact, the features I have talked about, are features which did not necessarily characterize this matter. On the contrary, you had many really opposite features. Take, for instance, this idea of putting the nation above the people, that the, that the nation has an independent metaphysical existence, which has nothing to do with the concrete existence of the people. Uh, this is something which was specifically rejected because the idea of the anti-colonial struggle was to improve the conditions of the people. 
the Karachi Congress Resolution of 1931 was one that actually specifically taught about the situation where the material conditions of the Indian people did go. Not only did it talk in terms of universal labor, franchise equality before law and all that, but additionally it also talked about the fact that the condition of the people would improve. And this was necessary because this was a national group which emerged in the context of an anti-colonial struggle. The anti-colonial struggle in India really took off during the 1930s when the peasantry was in deep distress because of the Great Depression and consequently this nationalism had to promise to the peasantry and to the working population in general that they would never again suffer the way they were suffering in the 1930s. In fact, in Gandhi's words, the idea of a free India is that tear, you know, is to wipe away the tears from the eyes of every Indian. So people were foregrounded. The concept of a nation or a nation state being formed independent of what's happening to the people simply did not inform this nationalism. And for the same reason again, because it was engaged in an anti-colonial struggle, it had to be an inclusive nationalism. Because if you have an anti-colonial struggle, you unite everybody and you say extraordinarily powerful enemy. If you don't do so, then imperialism or colonialism in that period would actually take advantage of the fissures in your society in order to thwart your anti-colonial struggle. So it necessarily had to be an inclusive struggle. Not only was it inclusive in the sense that the attempt was to include everybody within it, but what is more, it was also inclusive in the sense that Indian anti-colonial struggle cannot succeed if you do not form at least some kind of friendship, some kind of solidarity with other anti-colonial struggles. As a result, it was inclusive also in an international sense that the Indian anti-colonial struggle also tried to reach out to others, you know, uh, whether it's the Chinese or, 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 or elsewhere, there was certain sensitivity about similar struggle or Indonesian or sensitivity about similar struggles going on elsewhere and consequently the, the features which characterized the emergence of nationalism in Europe were not the features that characterized the emergence of nationalism here. On the contrary, you had an anti-colonial nationalism which was inclusive, which was democratic, and which actually was egalitarian promise and improvement in the conditions of life to everybody. Now the like of this kind of nationalism had not been seen anywhere before. It was very unique. It was very unique. It was a very different trajectory of nationalism. And one must not confuse this nationalism with the European nationalism. Now of course, I don't want to idealize this nationalism. The fact remains that insofar as the bourgeoisie was one of the elements, the emerging Indian bourgeoisie was one of the elements in this anti-colonial struggle, in fact, provided leadership to this anti-colonial struggle, there was an admixture of aggrandizing nationalism that also crept into it. It was always, if you like, an undercurrent, but on the other hand, it was nonetheless quite different from aggrandizing nationalism per se. Not only was the nature of this nationalism different, but I think even structurally it was differently constituted. In the sense that I think since it was an anti-colonial struggle, it was the people becoming a nation. In other words, an idea of India may have existed as some kind of geographical entity in the, in the, in the writings of Amir Khosru. But on the other hand, the, the idea of the people of India coming together in an anti-colonial struggle and thereby through this struggle setting up a nation state to replace the colonial nation state meant that the people were constituting themselves into a nation, it was a nation in the making. And if people are going to constitute themselves into a nation, as opposed to the nation being seen as a metaphysical entity existing independent of the people, in that case, the basis of that constituting was the kind of social contract. Now, this social contract is something which 
was first articulated in my view in the 1931 Karachi Congress resolution because obviously the question arose that you know, okay, we are thinking of independence, we are fighting the British, but what is independent India going to look like? It became essential to define what independent India is going to look like and of course that is how the Karachi Congress resolution came up. Incidentally, even in the 1857 revolt, some people had actually got a manifesto out of what an and in the, uh, or what an India free of British rule would look like. But that was the it is, but basically, and the Karachi Congress resolution which provided a number of things, uh, such as, as I said, equality before law, separation of the state from the religion, the state will have no religion, basically a statement of secularism, uh, universal adult franchise, um, free and compulsory private education, and incidentally, the abolition of capital punishment. I mean, the students in my university are being accused of being anti national because they were opposed to the hanging of the Guru, but fundamentally, the anti colonial nationalism that was formed in India was formed as the basis of a social contract that said abolition of the death penalty. That is 1931. We still haven't achieved that, just as we haven't achieved free and compulsory primary education and many other things. Uh, but the basic thing is that, in a sense, the constitution of India was really one that was based upon that social contract. Uh, many of the things promised in the Karachi Resolution went into the fundamental rights. Some of the things promised, alas, went into the directive principles of state policy Therefore, they were not binding upon anybody. They were not economic rights. There was no right to employment, right to food, etc., which was a major lacuna. And of course, this is something which basically meant that over a period of time, even though the constitution held, which gave political rights uh, to people, at the same time, the capitalist tendency, capitalism had always been one of the features, and the bourgeoisie was one of the components of the multi-class coalition that fought British rule and the bourgeois development that took place subsequently, essentially such development is inequalizing and over a period of time therefore this inequalizing development posed a challenge to the implicit social contract upon which modern India was actually founded. Now of course it is the case that the original idea of many, I mean, I, I, I think Gandhi, Ambedkar, Nehru, they all saw that there was a basic contradiction between capitalist development on the one hand and of course the social contract on the other hand. Uh, each of them had a very different idea about what to do, how to control capitalist development, or how to negate capitalist development, what would be the optimal arrangement in terms of economic institutions in the country. But ultimately, the Nehruvian idea, and that became the governing idea, was that you would be able to control capitalism by having all these quotas and control the licenses and so on. The whole idea was that the tendency of capitalism to generate inequalities, to, 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 to therefore go against the social contract, would be kept in check. If capitalism itself is kept in check, public sector has a very great importance. And the idea was that you could actually control the spontaneity of capitalism. Then we already saw at the end of the 1960s when he set up the, uh, in the 1960 when he set up the Maharajnobis Committee to look at uh, inequalities in, in, in wealth and income, that actually inequalities in wealth and income were beginning to grow. The fact that somewhere capitalist development was undermining the social contract is something which was becoming apparent even then, and of course with neoliberalism, it becomes even more clearly apparent, and now we have enormous increases in wealth and income inequalities that has taken place over the last few years. Now, I mean, in, in the neoliberal period, this entire trajectory of inclusive, democratic, egalitarian nationalism is something which had, which faced resistance, opposition from two quite different sources. One source was of course traditional society, the, those who obeyed to the caste system, because by the way in a situation 
which you have millennia of caste oppression, millennia of social inequalities characterized by untouchability, unseeability and so on, to have equal rights for everybody, to have universal adult franchisement and enormous need. I have myself seen the anger with which this need was uh, seen in, by, by people who have belonged to the traditional society, to like not my village, not as in the 1952 elections. The kind of anger that landlords in my village, or the Brahmin landlords, uh, felt that the Dalit fellows vote as the same weight as their vote. They were incensed by this. So the point is that there was always a massive resistance which did not necessarily immediately manifest itself, but it was always there uh, to this entire new region, to the social contract and the people becoming a nation on the basis of this social contract. The second kind of resistance would of course arise from the leading echelons of the capitalist class because as I said, capitalism is inequalizing and if capitalism's inequalizingness is something which undermines the social contract and therefore capitalism is reined in, then they are the ones who would resist this. So there are two different kinds of opposition which were always there against this anti-colonial, anti-imperialist, inclusive nationalism that the Indian and other third world countries' freedom struggles tried to develop and articulate and which, as I said, is a very unique feature, very unique feature, very different from European nationalism. So I believe these two elements, on the one hand, votaries of the traditional society, which are the votaries of Hindutva on the one hand, and of course corporate capital, monopoly corporate capital on the other hand, are now coming together in order to propound an aggrandizing nationalism for India. And the point is that there is a deception in it because the suggestion is that this nationalism is the same as the anti-colonial nationalism. Therefore, the kind of popular support and acceptance that the anti-colonial nationalism has and has is something which is thought to be illicitly appropriated by this new kind of nationalism which is being proposed, proposed, uh, proposed and which I think is basically the ideology of the corporate Hindu combined. Now this nationalism that is being propounded on the basis of which people are being called anti-national, just contrast it. If you are thinking in terms of a people becoming a nation, if you are thinking in terms of a nation in the making, if you are thinking in terms of a people becoming a nation on the basis of a certain social contract. How is a social contract to be enforced? How is a social contract that is arrived at through all kinds of diverse people coming together to be enforced? One answer which Lenin had is the right to secession. Suppose it is the case that there is a particular part of the country, particular region which feels that the social contract it had entered to, into is one which is being violated by the dominant region's literacy, that that region should have the right to secede. That was Leninist argument, you know, the right of nations to self-determination. Now that was not, that was not anything that was incorporated into the Indian constitution. But because it was not incorporated into the Indian constitution, it becomes particularly important <coughs> if we wish to maintain the unity of this nation in the larger sense, which is a nation in the making, that any such complaints that any particular region must have, any such disaffection must be sympathetically listened to, must be discussed, must be debated, and if possible, must be rectified. In other words, the, 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 the fact that the right to secession does not exist implies that for keeping the country together, there has to be an enormous amount of tolerance of dissent, an enormous amount of tolerance of complaints based on disaffection by particular regions or by particular groups and so on. Therefore, I believe that to call any such dissent, to call any such disaffection anti-national is something which is 
not a part of the inclusive anti-colonial nationalism. In other words, I would argue that a feature of the inclusive anti-colonial nationalism is that it should not use the adjective anti-national. Okay. Except, of course, if, if, if violence is involved, terrorism is involved and so on. But purely for expressing disaffection and dissent, the inclusive nationalism, the inclusive democratic nationalism, it is not, it must not be a part of its nature to call any such dissent anti-national. You call it anti-national only when you are moved to an alternative notion of nationalism, only when you are moved to an aggrandizing nationalism that has got surreptitiously or deceptively substituted for the inclusive nationalism. But, and, 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 and mind you, this, this, this is been continuously this, this language of using nationalism as a homogeneous category is something which is so misleading. I mean, just, just take, for instance, the argument which is being put forward by, I think, J.T. or somebody said, to Rahul Gandhi, your father was national, your grandfather was national, but why are you anti-national? What this misses is that the national that ever was referred to a nationalism quite different from the nationalism on the basis of which Rahul Gandhi has been called anti-national. You know, in, in other words, there is a change in the concept which has taken place and consequently uh, uh, the, the, the accusation is based on the assumption of a similarity of the concepts. Similarly, just imagine, here you have a situation where the finest institutions in the country, whether it is Jawaharlal Nehru University, whether it is Jalalpur University, whether it is University of Hyderabad, whether it is Pune Film Institute, whether it is the Fine Arts Faculty of Baroda and so on, the finest places, the finest places of academic and creative excellence are being targeted. They are being called anti-national. Suppose you actually close down, destroy these institutions. In that case, you have nothing, you know, in that case you become parasitic for your ideas on foreign countries. Because if it is the case there is not in you, then all the history or economics or sociology that you have learned here would have to be what they are teaching in American universities. Therefore, destroying your very best institutions is actually an anti, you know, this is, is on the grounds of being anti-national, is at the same time opening up the nation to the intellectual hegemony, which are only the precursors of other forms of hegemony by imperialism, by the advanced capitalist countries. But then if you do this, they are obvious that your concept of the nation, your concept of anti-national has nothing to do with imperialism, has nothing to do with the metropolitan hegemony. If it had, then you would not be attacking these institutions as being anti-national, because that itself is something which subverts the you know, the, the, the country withstand, uh, country's ability to withstand metropolitan hegemony. So these notions of national are forever, these, these dissimilar notions, in fact I would say completely contradictory notions of national and uh, are being continuously, uh, you know, kind of, one has been deceptively substituted for the other. But it is not only the question of the deception, I think it has a very important implication and that consists in the fact that, that you know, once, okay, if, if it is the case that the nation in the second sense stands, or the, if it is the case that aggrandizing nationalism implies that the nation still stands above the people, what is this nation that stands above the people? In other words, what is the concept of the nation that is supposed to stand above the people? Obviously not the nation in the making, but some pre-existing notion of the nation. But that pre-existing notion of the nation is of course something which is full of caste, which is full of kind of, you know, where, let us say, minorities, uh, that is Muslims, where the, the, the Dalits and the women and so on are all kept in a subsidiary status or, or put into a subsidiary status. So aggrandizing nationalism is not just one which is based on deception. Aggrandizing nationalism is necessarily one which 
constitutes, in my view, a counter-revolution. If we had a long social revolution, uh, which one person, one vote, and so on, actually uh, enshrined, then what we are now seeing through this aggrandizing nationalism is the, a reversion to a past which is characterized by the oppression of Dalits, by the oppression of women, by the oppression of minorities, and so on. It is actually an attempt, in a sense, to put the clock back. Because that is the only concept of nation that can be appealed to if you are talking about an aggrandizing nationalism which puts the nation above the people. Now, if you do that, then essentially what you are talking about is the creation of a nation state, which in my view would be a fascist nation state. You know, Mussolini defined fascism as a fusion of co a merger of corporate and state power. To that, I suppose, to spell it out, one has to add the merger of corporate and, 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 and state power, which at the same time apotheosizes the ideology of an aggrandizing nationalism and of course relies on a whole group, not just of state apparatus, but a whole group of workmen and thugs and strong troopers in order to enforce this ideology on people who dissent. And consequently, the notion of a fascist state in the Indian context would have to be one towards which we would be moving because it would be a corporate backed authoritarian state which idealizes the notion of an aggrandizing nationalism and sustains it on the basis of mobilizing stormtrooper social forces which uh, are in addition to the institutions and, and, and instruments of the state itself. That's the direction we are moving into. Therefore, if we value democracy, if we value dissent, if we value uh, egalitarianism, inclusiveness, and so on, it is very essential for us to see that what's happening in the ANU is not just something which affects the ANU, what's happening in Hyderabad is not just something that affects Hyderabad, but this is really a very serious attempt to change the nature of the Indian state from being what, what, what the constitution defined it to be uh, into being a, a, a fascist state. But you see, there is the last point I want to make is the following. That, that, you know, in the Indian conditions, any effort to shift towards this fascist state would also give rise to resistance, which would not always be a democratic resistance. It will give rise to resistance of the kind we are finding in, in a lot of Middle Eastern countries. It will give rise to resistance of a counter-fascism kind. And when that happens, then you will find a real social disintegration as far as this country is concerned. And therefore, the only way I believe that this country can be kept together is through the notion of an inclusive nationalism. And any movement away from that is something to the panacea for social disintegration. The third world is littered with failed states in quotes. A lot of these failed states have been made to fail because of imperialist intervention. In our case, we would again land up as being a failed state, not necessarily through direct imperialist intervention, but through the kind of uh, aggressive, aggrandizing nationalism which has been thrust down people's throats now by the corporate and political alliance which is in power at this moment. And I think it's very important for us to really wake up to this danger and to resist it. I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. After our, our question like, and uh, discussion, I would request you to keep the question short and uh, can we take two questions at a time so that it will be clear. Uh, so you have this contrast between you know, the aggrandizing nationalism of Europe uh, and the nationalism in India that you said was built in a social contract. Uh, I just wonder if, you know, uh, the contrast is, it's, is as stark as you made it out to be. Uh, because even if you look at someone like Gandhi, uh, who, you know, uh, was not like the head who tried to control capitalism much more strongly, 
uh, if you look at his attitude towards labor, for example, you know, when they tag uh, Mahajan Mazdoor, Sang was set up, uh, it was uh, uh, an attitude where he often said that, you know, the interests of the nation or the interests of freedom struggle uh, may need to be privileged over the interests of the workers. Uh, and uh, the reason I mention this actually is because in a sense it's a political point. It's a question of whether when one looks at uh, you know what uh, the BJP and the Hindu forces are doing to nationalism today, uh, whether one harks back to the situation that existed between you know independence and the start of liberalization, or whether one looks for something that's you know a comprehensive reform of that. And it's something that of course also relates to more immediate you know, political alliances. Uh, and positions that one has to make. Uh, so I just, you know, that's something I, I feel is important as well. That, that. Shall I take one more question or shall I just... Is there one more question immediately? If so, then I'll just take yes, please. I think this is not a sudden development. This is not a sudden development that happened yesterday with the NDA coming. Yeah. Over a period of time, I think we have not been uh, Facing it up. So, over there? Yes. So, mic is not working. Just keep uh, The thing you said about uh, the, the aggrandizing nationalism and the formation of EU kind of do contrary to each other. So, let's say in, if in the future we tend to go into the idea of Marxist utopia as in a formation of a whole world single state against like there are no nations at all, do you think at least it's possible at an ideological level or do you think there is an internal urge for uh, devoting oneself to a nationalistic agenda or can humanity as such live without any so sort of nationalism at all, like, uh, without any geographical distinctions whatsoever? Okay, uh, let me just answer these questions. You know, when Gandhi says that the interest of the nation, he is really talking about the preservation of the class alliance against colonialism. In other words, he is not talking about a metaphysical notion of a nation. He is really talking. Okay, that's not Gandhi's language, but the way I see it is that he is really talking about preservation. A lot of the things Gandhi says actually are really meant, have to be interpreted in my view as an attempt to preserve the class balance. Okay, so that is still quite different from a metaphysical notion of a nation that actually stands above the people. Uh, then, uh, yes, I mean, you know, I, 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 I would completely agree with you that, that we cannot uh, idealize uh, the anti-colonial, but, but you know, I, the point is not idealizing, it is, there is no idea which actually holds in reality. I don't idealize socialism either. I, I think of it as something to which one can approximate over a period of time. But the point is, nonetheless, achievements of that anti-colonial nationalism must not be underestimated. In any case, my point is to draw a distinction. But having drawn the distinction, the achievements of that anti-colonial nationalism should not be undertaken. Because I just give you one example. Okay, one is the very obvious thing that, that the very fact of political rights and so on which are being given to everybody, it has met a very significant change okay, in, in the landscape. The poor continue to be poor. We are living in a capitalist society. The poor continue to be poor. Now even the social contract is something which is being, um, as it were, negated. Uh, but nonetheless, what, in other words, I'm trying to say that what achievements we have had are now being, so even such achievements we have had are sort of be rolled back. And this is also true in the realm of the polity. You know, the CPIM, which is the largest communist formation, for a very long time, had accepted the Leninist notion of the right to secession. It was changed in 1972 in the Madurai Congress of the Party. Now remember, Jyoti Basu became, and they formed the government in West Bengal, who united from governments in 1967 and 1969, when Jyoti Basu was the deputy prime chief minister of the state. You, in other words, had a political party and a leader of the political party being the deputy chief minister of the state under the constitutional arrangement. Now, the party that was at the same time officially a candidate holding the view of right to secession. That's what I mean by accommodative. You know, fundamentally there is an accommodative nature, but now 
Now, let alone Yudhi Basu saying something or party saying something, you, some year you students say something and then, then they are charged with the secession, you see. Uh, you know, that, that this distinction is, is what I want to, to kind of highlight. It is kitsch, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I, I just find it incredible how anybody can look at a billionaire waving the tricolor at the India-Bangladesh match as a symptom of nationalism while Yale you students who are acutely concerned about the oppression that is taking place in Manipur, that, that, that is taking place in, 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 in JNK and so on, which are undeniable facts, again, which Iraq Shurtala, let us say, has been going on fast for decades. Uh, now, that is considered, if you raise your voice against it, that's considered anti national. So, you know, there's a kind of Kitsch, you know, it's not just the spurious appropriation of one nationalism by something substantively different, but I think it's a very dangerous substitution where you are legitimizing inequality, you are legitimizing uh, compromise with imperialism, but at the same time you are kind of, you know, shouting from house talks about nationalism. Uh, reform, yes, I, I, I agree with you that, that, that since I, I believe the fight against this aggrandizing nationalism, would have to take the form of developing the tradition of inclusive nationalism and I personally believe that development is not possible unless you go beyond neoliberal capitalism. Okay, uh, okay I, this is the point there, I, I come back to let me just go to the other others. Okay, now, uh, yes, it has been happening over a period of time. You know, it's not as if something happens suddenly. I believe the material conditions or this kind of an aggrandizing nationalism arises with the neoliberal shift itself. I said Adam Smith's argument, wealth of nations, capital grows, okay. Uh, but people's conditions does not grow. People's conditions remain the same. But there's a capital accumulation and that's supposed to be the nation's objective. Today when we say GDP growth is 9%, you know, I mean, we, we, we privilege GDP, then Mentally, intellectually, we are sliding towards that kind of a notion where people don't matter, but actually GDP growth matters. Why does it matter? Obviously, because in some sense, national power is associated. Emerging superpowers, emerging economic superpowers. So, so in some sense, national power has been privileged over the conditions of the people already. So, this was happening even before the NDA came. But what I'm trying to say is that in the NDA now you have a very ruthless attack in imposing this notion of nationalism towards which the country will move in any way. Alright, now, uh, yeah. Yes, uh, EU. Yeah. You know, I believe that nationalism, as long as there is imperialism, as long as there is imperialism, you would have to have an inclusive nationalism, and that really takes you back to that point. Okay, let me just try and state what I have in mind. We have neoliberal policies. Neoliberal policies are being imposed by international globalized finance capital, with which our corporate fellows, our corporate entities, are deeply enmeshed. Oh, okay. We know that it is giving rise to peasant suicides. It is giving rise to unemployment. It is giving rise to massive increase in the reserve army of labor, which is camouflaged as informal employment and this and that. I mean, I think I brought up the statistic that shows what great informal sector growth there has been is, is something which is actually, which is actually a state of impoverishment. You know, in the 1930s, in the Great Depression, a lot of the people who didn't have jobs, they decided to do shoe shine. You know, they would just stand and sit by the road and then request people to shine their shoes. Shoe shining was basically an expression of disguised unemployment. But on the other hand, you could say that in the 1930s there was no depression. There was a massive boom in the shoe shining industry. Employment increased dramatically in the shoe shining industry. You could say. Now, like that, people who interpret Indian statistics now say, oh, you know, there's been tremendous growth in what, you know, uh, entrepreneurship, you know, I mean, in, in self employment. What is self employment? Self employment basically is the reserve army of labor which is doing somehow, you know, I mean, it just do such something to, 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 to kind of get a bit of income and that is seen as an enormous boost in self-improvement. Now, all, all these are therefore uh, fallouts of the neoliberal economic policy. 
If you are going to fight against the neoliberal economic policies, there are two ways. By the way, a lot of the European Marxists actually say this, that look, if you fight against neoliberal economic policies, let us say, in the country, inside the country, tomorrow suppose the government comes into being like in, in Bolivia or like in Greece or like in Venezuela, uh, which happens to be a left-wing government, it wants to come out of neoliberalism. What would it do? It would cordon itself off from globalization. It would withdraw from globalization. Now, any withdrawal from globalization, therefore, would mean a withdrawal into a national economy. Therefore, any opposition to globalization from within a particular country is necessarily a revival of a national project. The alternative is to wait till there is international working class action, international peasant action, and then instead of worker peasant alliance inside the country, have a global worker peasant alliance overcoming globalization. But waiting for that is like waiting for God. I mean, it's never going to come in the, in, the, in the foreseeable future. That would actually mean a liquidationism where you basically accept neoliberalism for the foreseeable future. I believe that is something which is wrong. If that is wrong, then I would argue that nationalism of the other kind, not of the aggrandizing kind that is actually pro-imperialist, but nationalism of the anti-imperialist kind, remains the idea around which you can mobilize a worker peasant alliance and have an alternative agenda. And that would remain valid in my view until imperialism exists. So, so, so nationalism, now I am not saying imperialism would exist forever. But obviously nationalism is something which may wither away over a period of time, but you cannot do without it in the current historic conjuncture. Uh, so see, see, we can begin with the RSS has created just now. Asking for smaller states, I think it needs to be commented. Mm -hmm. they, have, they are asking for smaller states. <laughs> and earlier they were not like that. Huh? Okay, I'll tell you. And uh, sir, yeah. allow me to ask you a couple of questions, in fact. Uh, one is, you spoke a great deal about nationalism. My question is about how, what is anti-nationalism exactly? So, what, 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 what? what is anti-nationalism? Suppose if I am critical of road, maybe government, maybe army, going a step further, maybe police, maybe right to self-determination of the state, where does this boundary end? Exactly, a person become anti-national. And second, you spoke a great deal about, in fact, a critical of neoliberal economy. My question is, what are the what are the options left with us? Because some very eminent person said, we need money to eliminate poverty. Poverty cannot eliminate poverty. Means in uh, West Bengal, we have seen over the past ten years the GDP has grown just by two percent. Correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, all over India, GDP is much better. So, what's your what are your thought on that? You see, on the okay, let let me first take the smaller states up. You see, I think what is actually happening in the name of cooperative federalism, there is actually a centralization that is taking place. Okay, this centralization, I think, this centralization itself is a symptom of a transition to a fascist state. The centralization is something which is, you know, most people say, look at the Finance Commission, it has made so many resources available now. As a matter of fact, whatever resources the, the, the central, the, the Finance Commission has made available to states is more than offset, more than offset by the reduction in transfers from center to the states under other heads. If you take the total transfers from the center to the states under all events as a proportion of GDP, it has fallen. It has been falling, it has actually fallen. If you have GST, goods and services tax, then the autonomy of the states even to raise taxes goes. Okay. So you actually are having a centralization that is taking place and the small states is to my mind a part of the centralization which is taking place. Uh, now, your, your other question, what is anti-nationalism? You see, I think any expression of opinion, any expression of 
a conception of what's happening in various parts of India, no matter how unpalatable, can be considered anti-national. Okay. If it is the case that somebody is actually using a violent method to change the nature of the Indian state, then it is something which can be considered then. I mean, you know, then you can debate it anti-national or terrorism, for instance, can be anti-national. Suppose you worry of ISIS style terrorism, that would be considered anti-national. But on the other hand, any expression of opinion, any expression of dissent, any expression of any perception of truth cannot be considered anti-national in my view. Must not be considered under the inclusive notion of nationalism because that would be an occasion for introspection for us. Why is it that the Kashmiri youth is saying this? It's a matter that we have to ask ourselves and that is something which would deepen the, the kind of foundations of our inclusive nation. Uh, then you talked about this um, this business of uh, GDP. You know, I mean, you see, there's a huge literature which exists on this. During the period, let's take the period of 2004 5 to 2009 10. Let's take five years period during which the Indian economy was growing very rapidly. That is the period in which hunger in India increased to a level where India today has a lower level of malnutrition, a greater level of malnutrition than sub-Saharan Africa. You know, please do not get taken in by all kinds of official propaganda. Just look at the figures. You know, this is just something which is immediate, obvious, calculated. This is something which is there in National Sample Survey data, but it is there even in macro data. If you look at the per capita availability of food grains in India, by which I mean net output, that means output minus seed and so on, net imports plus net imports, that is, minus net additions to crops, whatever is available to the people. If you look at per capita food grain availability to the people, the annual figure at the beginning of the 20th century in what was then called British India was about 200 kilograms per year. It declined dramatically by about 25% to about 150, actually it was a bit less, 146 kilograms if you take the quinquennium. These are all quinquennium averages. In the year 1945-46 alone, if you take one year, it was about 138 kilograms, very sharp drop. Then, after independence, with great effort, there is an increase which takes place until about the end of the 1980s, which is about, let's say, 177 kilograms. Round terms. Then it plateaus, and now there is a very sharp drop again. And today, the per capita food grain availability is about 162 kilograms. Okay, 180 to 162. Right. So, so, so the point is that that precisely during the period when GDP growth takes place is a period in which you have greater hunger. So the idea that somehow, you know, you need money, of course, I would be 100 percent with you if the government said, yes, in fact, they used to say that at the 11th five-year plan, the document said, let GDP growth take place. They had adapted by the, the trickle-down idea that automatically not that people are going to become better off, but then we'll be able to tax more. And if you are taxing, if taxing more, then we can do more transfers to the poor. As a matter of fact, you find that as the GDP growth takes place on the basis of 89% and so on, then in order to keep that growth going, for instance, now make in India, to keep making India going, you have to make even more concessions to the capitalists. So this day of taxing them in order to bring about the desired redistributive transfer never comes. Okay. So the idea of linking GDP growth with improvement in people's living standards whether it is through trickle down or even through fiscal intervention is something that has been proven to be wrong. Okay. And consequently, I think direct improvement in the conditions of the life of the people is essential, for which you have to tax heavily, because India, by the way, has one of the lowest tax GDP ratio than anywhere in the world. There is no wealth taxation in India was the name. No. Piketty was recently in JNU and he was surprised at how come every country in the world has some wealth taxation, some in India virtually zero. And, and consequently you have, you know, wealth inequalities have increased dramatically in India in the last few years. So the point is that therefore 
any government that wants to improve the lot of the people would immediately have to raise the tax GDP ratio. I, I believe that you can actually institutionalize a set of economic rights, right to food, right to employment, right to uh, quality, publicly funded healthcare. We have Srinivas Reddy Committee report that actually says devote 1.8% of GDP more to what is currently being given, and you can have universal public health coverage of the entire population. Quality and free publicly funded education, at least up to a certain level, and let's say uh, old age pension, you know, adequate old age, universal old age pension and disability benefits. Now, if you are to have just this minimum set of justiciable universal economic rights, you require about 10% of GDP. In India today, some of all of it is raised through taxes. In India today, the tax GDP ratio is 14 percent. So it might go up to 24 percent, but that's the ratio in America. So then you're not even doing any great revolution. But the point is, the moment you do this, the moment there's a government that is coming in order to raise taxes and do transfers, immediately there will be a flight of capital from the country. Finance would flow out of the country. Quite apart from the media bits that would take place, quite apart from the political thing that would take place, of the kind that's happening in Brazil now. In Brazil now, there's a concerted attack by the right and the media on Dilma Rousseff and, and Lula and everybody. Anyway, so, so, so the point is that the moment you do this, capital will begin to flow out. The moment you do this, there will be media opposition and so on. If capital flow has to be prevented, you have to put capital controls. If you put capital controls in the American country, you put capital controls, you have to put sanctions against you. In which case you have to develop, you know, you have your trade controls, develop things of your own. If they are not buying your exports, then you can't buy their imports. I mean, you know, you can't be. So, so, so even this, while it is a perfectly feasible plan, would come up against opposition from metropolitan powers and the domestic corporate financial oligarchy, that would imply that one thing would lead to another and it will set you off on a dialectics of change of an alternative. So I, let me start by apologizing in case you said something in answer to my question in the past 10 minutes. Uh, I was at the other meeting that you had in the Which other meeting? It's a bit as I Oh, oh I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, no, so, I mean, it seems to me that in, in terms of, like, very strong visceral differences on notions of nationalism, uh, they, they, all, they seem to be centered around that territorial definition of nationalism, right? And because uh, many people would make a distinction on, on sort of across the spectrum, political spectrum, between the state and the nation, and, and they, they're sort of willing to accept uh, a wide range of criticism of, of the state and its failings, uh, but seem to take a position that what the nation is saying. Right? And then if you sort of really look at what they mean, it seems to have to do with territorial integrity. Right? And, and many people have said so in so many words, saying you know, that's the red line uh, that, that you're not supposed to cross. Now, if you look at an anti colonial notion of nationalism, uh, one is really fairly neutral about this issue, right? And one could argue that even an aggrandizing nationalism isn't really, uh, shouldn't, doesn't have a very uh, sort of sacred place for territorial notions of nationalism, except perhaps on the cultural nationalism side. And that's really only the place, the only place where I see territory seems to be somehow made out to be sacred, right? But, but if you look at all the sort of very strong visible disagreements of, of ideas of who is national, who is not national, it seems to be centered around this. I would like you to comment about it. It was interesting that you mentioned Lenin and you mentioned the, 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 sort of the, the time course of the yeah. Indian Communist Party, right, right. where in fact this is the issue they seem to have dealt with. Yeah. You know, the reason why the Indian Communist Party, well, CPIM, change its uh, program to abandon the right to secession had nothing to do with accusations of being anti-national. It had to do with the fact that actually imperialism uses 
the right of secession in order to break up big countries. I mean, we have seen in front of us Yugoslavia. I mean, you know, in a, a big country like Yugoslavia being actually broken up. And, and, and certainly, uh, in, the, in the breakup of that, it's a matter to be studied, but I believe the role of German imperialism was quite important, you know, because they did encourage, first of all, countries like Slovenia to secede, etc. So, so I think uh, many people argue that, that I mean, Samir Ali would be one person who has argued that actually breaking up large countries in the third world is one of the agendas of imperialism. Now, whether that is actually an agenda or not, if you have I mean, the argument for doing away with the right to secession, is that it opens up the way for imperialism to do that kind of an intervention. This was the reason, this was the basis on which uh, this was done. And, and oh, of course, you know, I mean, it's a fact, you, you know what happened in Congo when, when, when Katanga was allowed to, you know, was encouraged to secede, you know what happened in Nigeria. There, there are lots of third world countries in which the effort has been made against the progressive regime in particular to actually introduce uh, secession I mean, as, as a means of breaking up and as a means of basically uh, bringing that progressive regime to, to kind of, you know, uh, okay, and we need to brief. Now, territorial, yes, since any, even, uh, okay, since any anti-colonial nationalism, what is the purpose of an anti-colonial struggle? It must be to substitute the colonial state by an alternative state. That alternative state would have to be a nation state. Uh, if it is a nation state, then since the state always has a territorial jurisdiction, it would necessarily have to be territorially defined. Okay. But the fact that this nationalism is one that gives rise to a territorial based nation state does not mean that it's a prefixed notion of the territory. It's not some Akhand Bharat or it's not this Bharat or that Bharat. It is actually territorially based, but I would like to see it as being based on a territory, the people of which are coming together to constitute the nation on the basis of the social contract. Okay. So it doesn't mean that because money portion is something that we must have as part of India, that I, I have a pre-existing notion of, let us say, a territory. Uh, so it is territorial, but it's not necessary. So, so all the more reason, according to me, why, given this fact that imperialism can use these differences, given the fact that, that any attempt at secession by any part would immediately be bounced upon by imperialism to act against the Indian state and so on, it becomes all the more necessary to be inclusive. It becomes all the more necessary to be sensitive to the feelings of those who might feel that they are being uh, Badly dealt with. You know, we talk about hearts and minds, winning the hearts and minds of the Kashmiri youths. I think what has happened in JNU and so on has done much more to win the hearts and minds of the Kashmiri youths than any number of initiatives that the government has taken place. Because there is an awareness that now in India there is a new generation which is actually thinking differently, which is thinking in a more humane manner, which is not thinking in terms of the old fashioned uh, kind of, not. this is the territory that we must control, come what may. Okay, so, so when I actually look at the future, I mean, okay, I think this is not just a new, I, I travel quite a lot, including coming here, uh, and I find that everywhere among the youths there is a kind of fervent. Uh, now I know that the youths of students alone uh, are not constitute a class and they are not going to bring about major changes, but I think ideas. Uh, as Cain said, the world is ruled by little else, and I think ideas are very important. I think the inculcation of some of these liberal, inclusive, accommodative ideas among students is one of the more positive things, which for the first time I feel might keep this country together. Contrary to what the others are saying, if for the first time I feel that maybe actually we would be able to keep the country together if you actually have such sensitive youths and sensitive students who are worried about what's happening in Manipur, what's happening in JNK, etc. This is the last, uh, last question because uh, we have to wind up. Sorry, I just... <laughs>
Uh, what is the incentive of this Hindutva uh, in largely constituted by the middle class in the alliance that you are talking about between the corporate power and then uh, the actors in the government now? Uh, from the side, the corporate is very clear, their economic interest is very clear, and even uh, the Hindutva you know, ideology would be important for them for social disciplining and so on. And they would be interested in having a chronic capitalist state for their economic enterprises get and going well. But uh, what is the incentive of the Hindutva actors? Yeah, okay, that's a that's very important but, but difficult question, I mean, you know. Okay, let me just say, uh, firstly, there are forces which have always been opposed to the liberation of Dalits, who have always been opposed to, let's say, the liberation of women, always been opposed to, 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 to Muslims and equal rights and so on. Those are very deep conservative forces in society. Whenever you have social change, and there's no denying that in India, you know, listen, I, I, I'm a leftist all my life. I've written against the change taking place. It is not enough. But on the other hand, it is really still quite substantial. It may not be enough as one would like to see, but at the same time, in terms of traditional society, it's quite substantial. So, so I think there is that element. I think then there is the element that a lot of the you know, if you, let's say, have a caste society, I mean, obviously, Dalits are excluded. You look at the patterns of employment which have been created under neoliberalism. Uh, some educated persons have got employment. The only place employment has been created in things like IT-related services and so on, where you need a certain minimum level of education, where actually the oppressed social groups are excluded anyway. As a result, such employment opportunities as have been created in the neoliberalism have been captured by uh, the upper caste, the better off segments of the population. They are not going to say that we have captured it because we are privileged. They will say we have captured it because we are more talented. These fellows are not. That's why they are not captured. So they imbibe the ideology of capitalism to justify their thing. There is therefore a certain fear that a generalization of education, the uplift of the Dalits and so on is going to threaten their own job prospects. Okay, it is very common, very common. You know, I, I, I must tell you that a lot of people, even progressive people, are terrified of a day when a Dalit boy has the same chance as my son. No? All right. And then I think in a period of crisis, things become much worse because then the opportunities are shrinking and therefore it becomes possible to pick one segment against another. In the last election, for instance, a very common thing was that why is the crisis? Two reasons were removed over here. One is that Manmohan Singh is what? A uh, weak person, you know, you need a strong man and so on. Poor governance, etc. And the other was that, you know, government's appeasement of the, of the laborers and the Dalits through MG and RHES. Some people even said MG and RHGS, which is a form of appeasement, is actually a form of corruption because you are trying to buy the Dalit votes by giving money and so on. So, so there would be substantial opposition by not only the ruling classes, but by a significant section of middle class, upper middle class youths towards any egalitarian agenda. And I think uh, what we are now finding in the and so on, forget about the last project where they should make some, some, some kind of statements, is an official abandonment of an egalitarian agenda. With the Congress, you had at least two segments. There was the Sonia Gandhi group, which kept talking about you know, uh, more egalitarian agenda, as opposed to the neoliberals. If you know, the neoliberals may be winning the day, there was always a kind of rival, and, and it was visible on the right to food, etc. There's a very clear debate on, on the right to food. Sonia Gandhi says right to food, but children says we can't afford it. You know, they're very clear. Uh, now with the, with the NDA, I think the egalitarian agenda is more or less completely capable. And I think that is something we should have the support of significant sections of the middle class and upper middle class. They want development, in other words, more jobs, etc. But that is not going to happen, by the way, because I believe the current uh, 
world capitalist crisis is going to be very protracted, it's very severe, it's not, the world is not coming out of it. In most advanced countries now, they have reduced nominal interest rates on loans from central bank and banks to negative. In nominal interest rates, in other words, central banks are now giving loans to commercial banks and negative interest rates, and you please give loans for consumption and investment so that there will be revival of the world economy. This is happening in the European ECB, European Central Bank, Bank of Japan, and so on. So, so, so this is a very serious crisis. And in that, any crisis produces both kinds of movement. It produces the radicalization, Jeremy Corbyn, Bernie Sanders, and so on. And it also produces tendency to affect President Trump. And so, so I think we are witnessing that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.